are about to be set on fire. I mean that now. Throughout this time together, you're going to have words spoken over you. You're going to be prayed over. The fire of God is going to fall on you because I have the publisher of Destiny Image and the author of Pentecostal Fire, Larry Sparks, is going to be with me. And he had a, an amazing vision, really a startling vision, of expository preaching and fire on the altar and what happened here you need to hear what he saw in this vision and how it applies to where we're headed right now in this end time move of the holy spirit so buckle up begin to pray in the holy spirit and get ready now of course all of these interviews and all of the work we do the ministry we do is only made possible by your support so would you prayerfully consider sowing into the word that you're receiving and the ministry that you're receiving from encounter today and all you have to do is go to EncounterToday.com, and there's some special offers there that you can take advantage of where we will send you a gift just to thank you for supporting and sponsoring the work that we do. We can't thank you enough for partnering with us. Now, stir yourself up, begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, and let's dive into this word. Now, Brother Larry, you had a vision of fire on the altar that I want to get into here in a moment, but you have written a book that I, I mentioned to you that I think is probably the most important work you've ever done and probably one of the most important works that I've read in a very long time, Pentecostal Fire. You're talking about our supernatural inheritance. So let me, let me dive into this. Maybe this is a different way to start the conversation. Why are you talking about Pentecostal Fire? Why not Charismatic Fire? Mm -hmm. Why that word? Why are you emphasizing that word? It's a provocational word, mm -hmm. Pastor Allen. Mm -hmm. That's the thing, because even the title, I had other people recommending, well, Larry, maybe change the title, make it a little bit more acceptable to people who might associate the word Pentecostal with some baggage, with some legalism, with some of the extremes of Pentecostalism. But I'm just going to put my church history revival nerd hat on for a moment and give hmm. you a very clear answer as to why. Number one, I feel like, and I don't want to sound overly spiritual on this because I'm a publisher and I get a lot of people saying, the Lord told me mm -hmm. to name this book this. And the title, I'm like, did the Lord really tell you that? <laughs> but I really sense that the Lord at least directed me towards this title. I had an encounter in March of 2021 at Fresh Start Church, a church we're both familiar with. Mm -hmm. Kim and Paul Owens called me up on stage. They prayed and prophesied over me. I had a powerful impartation, powerful touch of the Holy Spirit. But I didn't quite know what the Lord was doing. It was great. A lot of exhortation, encouraging words. But I went back to Dallas and I'm thinking, Lord, what did you really do to me while I was there in Phoenix? I know it was significant. And then my friend, who is a prophet, Anna Werner, reached out and she said, Larry, you really need to seek the Lord because something very significant was downloaded to you in Phoenix. So I did what we are all supposed to do when we receive either a prophetic word or a supernatural encounter with God that we know is God, but we can't quite make sense of it. We have to ask him. And that's my encouragement to those who are even watching right now. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit touches you or you get a prophetic word and you know it's from God. Listen, don't give God rest until you get clarity about that. Wow. Keep talking to him about it. Some people like to put things on the shelf. That's just charismatic buzzword we've come up with. I got this prophetic word, but I don't understand it. So I'm going to put it on the shelf. Prophetic words don't belong on the shelf. They belong close to your heart because <sighs> God wants you to be conversating. That's not even a word, but I just came up with it. He wants you to be talking with him in dialogue wow. about what he said to you in that prophetic experience. So I said, God, what did you do to me? in Phoenix, Arizona. He didn't really tell me what he did to me. He just made a very strong announcement. He said, Larry, tell my church I'm reintroducing her to Pentecostal fire. Mm -hmm. That was the phrase I felt like the Holy Spirit gave me. He didn't say charismatic fire. He didn't say spirit-filled fire. He didn't say empowered fire. A lot of the language that in the 21st century, we've been putting around the move of the Holy Spirit that quite honestly, has been diluting it. And again, I'm very grateful for the charismatic renewal of 1960. Sure. I'm very grateful for charismatic language, but there's something about Pentecostalism of the 1900s, really, that was pioneered, 
1900, Topeka, Kansas, 1906 with the Azusa Street Revival. There was a radicalness. There was a pursuit of the supernatural. There was an expectation that when somebody got baptized or filled with the Holy Ghost, something was going to happen. There was an evidence. And I know so many of our theological statements of faith in Pentecostal denominations still say things like that. Well, we believe in the baptism of the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, the evidence of the prophetic, there must be an evidence. I believe that is what Mm. God is doing. That is the reason I wrote this book. That is the reason I'm upholding this, this Pentecostal fire as the standard operating procedure of New Testament Christianity, because anything less, I believe, is below the standard, and it's below the baseline that Jesus died for us to walk in. That's why I called it Pentecostal fire, your supernatural inheritance. Bottom line, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We have access to everything that disciples, that the 120, that the early church experienced, released on that day of Pentecost that we see in Acts chapter 2. We have access to that. It is available now, and I don't want to water it down or dilute it because, Pastor Allen, where we are right now in the 21st century, particularly that the world and the climate and the craziness and the chaos that's surrounding us, the crisis and the chaos needs a church that is filled with the fire and the boldness of Pentecost. Come on. And all of you watching this right now, I really believe as he was even talking that the fire of God is going to fall. Even as you watch this interview, there is going to be an impartation. He had him write this book because he is releasing Pentecostal fire and it should be required reading. And I'm not just saying that this could be one of the most important books we've ever recommended on this channel. Every single one of you needs it in your library. The link is in the description of this video, but I want you to begin. If you pray in the spirit, pray in the spirit. If you do not begin to worship God because he is about to release Pentecostal fire. And one thing you say that really stood out to me in the book, he said, you said, what is revival? Revival is when the people of God return to the standard of the early church. And what is that standard? Pentecost. That's what we're trying to get back to. We're trying to get back to Pentecostal fire. Now, I want to ask you about a prophetic word that Dutch Sheets had. By the way, if you want to talk about endorsements, both Kim Owens and Dutch Sheets wrote forwards to this book that are phenomenal in and of themselves. He said something in there I wanted to ask you about because I think this is key. He said, I have many, and this is from the Lord, I have many new wineskins in old robes. Mm. And that jumped off the page at me. What does that mean for us right now? What does that mean when God says, I have many wineskins, but they're in old robes? What I believe he means there is we need to go back to the old fire. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the things that we've it's, it's interesting, new wineskin, a wineskin would be an operation or an operating system. How we operate in the 21st century, how we operate as the church, because I know that's kind of charismatic, prophetic language we throw around a wineskin. But where we are right now is we have gotten very hip. We've gotten very cool. We've gotten Mm. very relevant. Now, we are kind of post the seeker-friendly or seeker-sensitive movement because that really actually crumbled quite significantly with the toppling, sadly, of a few major ministries that were upholding that approach to church. So where we are right now, we're in this entertainment-oriented day where well-meaning, I'm going to say this, well-meaning, I believe Mm -hmm. genuine, sincere pastors and leaders want to see as many people come to Jesus as possible. They really do. I don't believe this is motivated by bad intentions. I just believe that many, even those who would claim some kind of charismatic or Pentecostal ancestry, who would be part of church networks now that are trying to make Pentecost or something charismatic a little bit more palatable and cool and hip and relevant. Mm. What's happened as a result of that is we've created these wineskins or operating systems for the church where we think specifically for young people, we're hoping that if we give them entertainment, if we give them a light show, if we give them Disneyland Christianity with Pastor Mickey and Minnie Mouse, if we do all of this kind of stuff with the goal of entertaining and bringing in as many people as possible, then we are going to win them. What? Here's the problem. You are not, and I'm going to say this boldly, you're not going to win 
win them to the authentic Jesus. You're going to win them to an idea of Jesus. God in his sovereignty, listen, saves people through these methods and models and wineskins. He does. I'm grateful that he does that. But the problem is you bring people to this kind of entertainment oriented church. You're going to have to continue to come up with gimmicks and gadgets and gizmos to keep these people attracted to this brand, this expression of Christianity. And what happens is, sadly, these leaders become celebrities. These leaders end up having very public falls. We're seeing that right now, Pastor Mm -hmm. Allen. I'm not going to name names because I don't feel like God's calling me to. But anybody who has a finger on the pulse of Christianity right now, we are seeing major leaders, not even just major leaders, major networks of churches getting a real hit. And I believe the positive is out of all of this, out of the rubble, is going to be two things. Number one, there's going to be people who are hungry and desperate for the real thing, for the real God, not entertainment experience that is packaged in Christian language. They are going to be hungry and desperate for a touch and encounter with the real living God. And number two, as a result of that, we need to preach and thus provide an atmosphere where people can connect with the God of Pentecost. New wine skin and old robe, bottom line is where we need to go into the future, into the new thing. We need to look back, and that's what this book is about. I have a whole chapter in here about the Pentecostal pioneers of the Mm -hmm. 1900s who paid a price post Azusa Street. Azusa Street happened in 1906 to 1909, but those who claimed Pentecostal Christianity, denominational Pentecostalism, those who pursued the move of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, divine healing, deliverance, the gifts of the Spirit, they were significantly persecuted. They were ostracized. They were rejected. Sadly and often, they were rejected from mainline Christianity. They were made fun of. I mean, I chronicle all of that in this particular chapter that's all about revisiting the Pentecostal pioneers. I believe what we need for the day we're stepping into, and I mentioned this early before, we need the new thing. The way forward is the old fire. The Mm -hmm. way forward is a church that says, you know what? We're going to tarry at the altar. What does that even mean? That's that's old school language, Alan. I believe God's bringing back the old school. They would talk about tarrying at the altar, waiting, contending in prayer, grabbing the horns of the altar. But do you know what? The people who use that language was basically all about, we're going to persevere at the altar until the fire of God falls. Those people saw the breakthrough. Those Mm. people saw the baptism. I mean, a mighty baptism of the Holy Spirit. Those are the people who saw the signs and wonders. Where we are in the 21st century, sadly, we are not. I'm going to end this segment with this kind of provocative and jarring statement. Where we are in the 21st century, we should be seeing increase. We should be seeing an increase of what we saw in the 1940s with the great healing movement in the latter rank. We should be seeing increase. Instead, sometimes we feel like those are the ceiling. It's sad that we look Mm. at John G. Lake and Smith Wigglesworth and Catherine Kuhlman, people who lived 60, 70, 100 years ago, and we look to them as the ceiling or the apex of what's possible. That is biblically illegal because the Bible tells me, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it is from glory to Mm -hmm. glory. And the fact that we are not stepping into increasing measures of glory tells me that maybe we've built an infrastructure, we maybe we've established a wineskin that is not actually conducive with increasing glory. So as a result, we've settled. As a result, we've kind of parked somewhere that I believe is beneath where God wants us to go. But the good news is this. He is depositing this holy hunger. He is stirring up and awakening a holy hunger and a holy provocation in his people right now. And I believe we can go as far and deep with God as we are hungry and thirsty to go. So that's what those old robes or the new wineskins. I believe the old robe is when we look back to the 1900s, what made classical Pentecostalism such a powerful, dynamic force? And I think we need to pay very careful attention to some of those elements. Yeah, what caused it to become the fastest growing segment of Christianity in the entire world? Dr. Lester Summerall said there's much to be gained by a return to the discarded values of the past. And you're Mm. right, the way forward is to go backward and to pick up those foundations. But currently in the, and not just in the American church, globally, there is this Calvinistic, reformed 
way of thinking concerning prayer, concerning uh, revival, that takes the sovereignty of God and wholly thrust everything that God is going to do entirely on his sovereignty and has nothing to do with us. You mentioned in the book, you say, stop praying for Pentecost to come live like it's here, but stop yeah. thinking revival is entirely up to God's sovereignty. How is this infected this, you know, what I've talked about the kind of that, well, if God wants to do it, he'll do it. Yeah. How is this infected really the charismatic Pentecostal church and how do we break free from it? It's really made us anemic. And it's interesting because I actually know some folks who are of the more reformed mm -hmm. Calvinistic perspective who are actually vigorously contending for the outpouring of the Spirit. One wow. of them is R.T. Kendall, Dr. R.T. Yes. Kendall, who really who recognizes where we are right now. We've settled for an Ishmael when there is an Isaac move of God wow. waiting for us. Doesn't mean that the Ishmael is wrong or false, but he would say what we've settled for up till now has been Ishmael compared to the Isaac or the child of promise or the fullness of what God wants to do. So I will give them a little bit of context there, but by and large, you're absolutely right. There's this neo Calvin, I call mm -hmm. it neo-Calvinism, neo-reform thing, where sadly there is such an inappropriate emphasis on the sovereignty of God. And listen, revival is sovereign in that I believe when God sovereignly responds or moves in revival, what it looks like is up to God. Mm -hmm. But the preparation or the tilling of the ground or the prep, the, the plowing and that company of people who cry out in hunger, that's up to us. I have a whole chapter in the book about stewardship and sovereignty. Revival is a divine collision of those two elements. Wow. Is mankind stewardship, I believe through prayer, crying out, desperation, making room for God. But then when he comes sovereignly with those sudden outpourings of the spirit, and suddenly there was a mighty rushing wind, and suddenly you had Father's Day 1995, where you had the Brownsville revival. Suddenly you had a day in January 1994 at a little church on the Toronto yes. airport runway where the spirit of God came in like a bomb. So there are suddenlies, there are, I, I highly value the sovereignty of God, but the bottom line there is sovereignty should never become an excuse for us not to do anything. The revelation of God's sovereignty is not an excuse for us to have this perspective on revival that it's one day someday, because I can tell you this, if we're always waiting around for one day someday, then we will never take res uh, an appropriate response responsibility for the moment we've been given. This is the moment we've been given, Pastor Allen. Yeah. We've been given this moment, this time, right now in the 21st century. I'm not going to keep saying, well, revival, the move of God is going to come one day, someday. And I, I, I will say this, I sell a lot of books if I use one day, someday language, because mm. people are so intrigued and fascinated by the future. If I talk about the seven signs of Jesus' return or the 10 things that you need to be on the lookout for as we approach the last days, people mm -hmm. love futuristic. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying it can war against revival because in contrast, if I write a book about how to actually steward what we've been given in the Holy Spirit now so we can see a landscape-changing move of God but the emphasis being on what we need to do to steward that, people are not going to buy as many copies. Why? It places a demand. It places a demand wow. on you, on me, on the church saying revival, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, revival is available and accessible to every single company of people, every church, every person on the face of the earth. I believe every church is maybe just a decision away from experiencing revival. And here's the decision. Will you quench the Holy Spirit? Uh, that question, yeah. I'm going to prophesy that right now, Pastor. And I feel the Holy Ghost yes. on this. I really believe we just experienced Pentecost. And I know when this comes out, you know, Pentecost will be recent in our minds. But I really sense the Lord saying you can experience a personal Pentecost. You don't need mm. to wait for a day in June to have Pentecost Sunday. You don't need to wait. Oh, I'm just going to wait for whenever God chooses me. You can actually do what Smith Wigglesworth said. He made a bold statement. He said, if God's not moving, I'll move him. Mm -hmm. People did not like that statement. But you know what? God likes that statement. God is looking for that Syrophoenician woman. He's looking for the woman with the issue of blood. Yes. Who are these people? The people in the Bible who said, I will 
touch the Lord. I feel the fire of yeah, God falling I'm right now, Pastor Alan. Time. So I'm going to go on this, go and ahead. then you can shut me up when I'm done. I feel the fire of God being released right now mm. through this video. For those of you who are saying, Blair, I'm just desperate. I'm desperate for God to touch me. And I feel the Spirit of the Lord asking, who will touch me? I feel mm. the Holy Spirit asking the question, who will touch God? Because the woman with the issue of blood had a lot to lose in the Bible because she was not even allowed to be seen out in public, but she heard what? She heard the testimony that Jesus was there. She heard that Jesus was there and available. I've got good news for you. Jesus is here. Yes. He is available. He is looking for the one, the man, the woman who say, I will reach out and touch him. I'll push through. I'll push through all the hindrances. I'll push through religion. I'm going to push through tradition. I'm going to push through maybe what my childhood taught me about God. I'm going to push through the false ideas I've had about God. And I'm going to follow these models in the Bible. I will touch him. And I've got good news. When you touch him, power comes out of him. Hmm. When you touch him, you will experience a fresh filling with the Spirit. But as I said before, you are just one touch away from revival. And it's not waiting around for God to touch you. It's, will you be the one? I'm talking to you. Will you be the one? Pastor, leader, will you be the one? Church, congregation, will you say, you know what? I don't even know what it's going to look like but we're tired. We're tired of the entertainment stuff. We're, try, we're, we're tired of trying to win people to, to Jesus with all these gimmicks and with, with things that just, but, but, but we, we want to see people experience God. We want people to touch God. I've got good news for you. If you will just say, God, do what you want. We will not quench the Holy Spirit, which actually in the Greek says, don't put out the Spirit's fire. I really believe you individually or pastor, leader, you and your church can experience revival. It is a decision away. It is a move towards God away. Will you move towards him mm. as opposed to just waiting around and saying, well, he can touch me whenever he wants. He is looking for the one who said, I will touch him at any cost in Jesus name. Wow. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. All yes. you have to do is reach out, grab hold of it. Somebody write push in the comments. Yeah. Push through the distractions, push through every hindrance, push through every preconceived idea and grab a hold of the power of Pentecost that's available to you right now. Yeah. And there is this interesting tension between hope and faith, between mm. tarrying and receiving the promise. And you've made it very clear that Pentecost looks like something. And we've drifted away from that and we've said it can be whatever. No, no, no. There is there is a look to Pentecost. It looks like something. It sounds like something. And you yeah. made a statement that made me throw down my book when I was reading it and, and just say, yes, God, do it again. You said no more wimpy baptisms in the Holy oh, Spirit. Man. No more wimpy baptisms in the Holy Spirit. What do you mean by that? And how do we get some strong men baptisms in the Holy Ghost? Come on. <laughs> I'm referring, by the way, I don't mean strong men. I'm, I'm referring to John G. Lake's strong man's gospel. Oh, yes. He said that the gospel was for the strong man because it brings strength, it brings healing and victory and deliverance. Yeah. So how do yeah. we get a strong man's baptism in the Holy Ghost? You know, here, here was my concern, and I think what provoked that statement is that there's a lot of churches that are more non-denominational, but they are interested in the things of the Spirit, but not mm -hmm. so much because they don't want to freak people out. And I've been to these services where at the end they'll say, okay, who wants to receive the Holy Spirit? I don't know if many of them will even use the word baptized in the Spirit. Who wants to receive the Spirit? Who wants to be filled with the Spirit? Just, just sit where you are. Lift your hand up. That's great. We're going to pray a nice prayer <laughs> over you. And they'll do that. Listen, part of my heart really celebrates that because part of yeah. my heart says I'm grateful that they're moving in that direction. So I, I want to celebrate the positive. But the negative... I'm going to say this outweighs the positive. The negative is this. You have people who lifted their hand, got a nice prayer, prayed over them, and then they go to lunch not knowing if anything actually happened. Wow. I'm going to say this at the risk of sounding a little bit controversial. There is an evidence when somebody gets baptized in the Holy Ghost. Yes. Well, Larry, why do you say Holy Ghost, not Holy Spirit? I, I did a little post about this recently. I prefer Holy Ghost, although when I'm praying and talking to God, I'll call Spirit of the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit. 
But to me in the 1900s, even before that, really, they would refer to him as Holy Ghost. And there was an expectation when you had a Holy Ghost meeting, something was going to happen there. You Mm. never know what's going to happen in that Holy Ghost meeting. I say, Lord, restore that wonder again. God, restore the expectation that when we come together and people are filled with, baptized in the Holy Ghost— There will be speaking in other tongues. There will be ecstatic prophecy. There will be a manifestation, a physical manifestation. It doesn't need to look the same. You know what? The person next to you is shaking and trembling, and the person to the other side is laughing, and the other person's weeping. I'm not so interested in what the manifestation is because I really believe all of those signs, all of those manifestations are actually pointing to the activity of a real God in our midst, and I actually Mm. celebrate them. I say, Pastor Alan, I, I... And people always are like, what? What do you mean when you say this? I say, I do not tolerate the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And right after that, I usually get a pause. They're like, well, we thought you wrote the book on Pentecostal fire and that you're charismatic and you're saying you don't tolerate them. And then I clarify. I say, I don't tolerate the manifestations. I celebrate them. Hmm. I celebrate them. I don't believe they should be distracting. I don't believe that they should call our attention away from Jesus. Absolutely. But when I see that activity happening in purity, I recognize God is moving in our midst and it looks like something. Otherwise, we have embraced what I would call just an academic or intellectual faith where, well, God's out there somewhere. He got everything started. He's that cosmic clock winder. He got things in motion and he's kind of distant and disconnected from everything. No, he is the God of Isaiah 64, one who tears open the heavens. He comes down, he moves in our midst. And as we were saying, it looks like something. And I am contending for once again, a baptism in the Holy Spirit, an encounter with God that actually looks like something. And that phrase actually came from a dream that I had, where in the dream, I was with a Pentecostal evangelist, Tony Suarez. And he looked at me, he looked at me and he said, no more wimpy baptisms in the Holy Spirit. Mm. And then he said something like, I want to see people's hair blown back again. And Mm. I I, I got a kick out of it. But at the same time, you know what? He does come like a mighty rushing wind. And I will say on the day of Pentecost and multiple other times throughout the book of Acts, in fact, any time where there was a significant Holy Spirit encounter, the folks knew it. There was a sign and there was a manifestation. We've kind of drifted into this into this weird place where we know we need the fire of God. We know we need the power of God, but we're not activating it. We're not we're not pushing through to grab hold of it in the same way that we could know that people need healing. And yet, if we never pray for anyone to receive healing, we're not going to see those manifestations. So I wanted to ask you this. When we're dealing with the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I believe we're dealing with the greatest evangelistic opportunity of the 21st century in the United States in particular and among Christianized the Christianized world. Because if you live in the buckle of the Bible belt like I do and, and places where everybody's saved, you know what I mean, as far as, oh, yeah. as, far as as they know, the greatest evangelistic opportunity is to share the power, the endowment of the Holy Spirit that is available to those who will believe. How can we begin to evangelize this? How can we minister? This is a real practical question. How do we pray for someone to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or how do we even begin to approach it? I would say this is that God is not looking for experts. My friend Miriam says it this way. He's not looking for the expert. He's looking for the hungry. Uh And I'm quite convinced if you can get a person, number one, I do believe we need to teach about it. I do believe we need to provide solid biblical teaching and a solid Bible framework on what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the fact that it is not the same thing as what we get at salvation. I'm just going to get a little theological for a moment. Mm -hmm, When we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. And that is wonderful. You are saved. Okay. You're not saved because you speak in tongues. You're not saved because of some supernatural manifestation. You are saved because the blood of Jesus cleanses you from sin. So that is why you're saved. And guess what? When the blood of Jesus cleanses you from your sin, you become a fit resting place. You become actually fit to become the tabernacle or the temple of the Holy Spirit, which Paul makes it very clear in Corinthians. You are the temple. You are the house of the Holy Spirit. And that is something we become because we are born again. But here's what I tell people about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to make it probably a little bit more clear and simple. I say, okay, you're born again, 
Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and that's wonderful. But here's the good news. He wants to rest upon you. Mm. The Spirit of God inside of you is in you for your sake. Yes. And Bill Johnson says it this way, the Spirit of God living inside of you is in you for your sake, but He wants to rest upon you for the sake of other people. Mm. You were just talking about the whole evangelism dynamic of that. So I believe we need to teach about it, but we need to make it a little bit more simple and say, John G. Lake, Smith Wigglesworth, Catherine Kuhlman, we look at them, sometimes we act like they are spiritual supermen and superwomen. No, they were all people often with some limitations. I mean, Wigglesworth was an illiterate plumber who I believe learned how to read the Bible, who, yes. who learned how to read by reading the Bible. That's correct. Catherine Coleman, let's just say, if you just start reading her story, even relationally, marriage-wise, I'm thinking of Amy Simple McPherson, all yeah. these people who yeah. are heroes of the faith, they had some issues, but I'll tell you what they all had. They had a hunger. And here's how I want to specifically give context to that hunger. I feel like the Lord's releasing this right now, Pastor yes. Allen, because yes. there's a lot of people, you've watched this, or you're watching right now, and you're like, I want, how do I get filled with the Holy Spirit? I mean, I, Larry, I believe God lives inside of me. You even said it. My, my body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. But what is this extra dynamic? What is mm. this thing that some of these great evangelists and miracle workers and revivalists of old, they obviously had something different. I want that. I feel like somebody right now, you're watching right now. this and you're saying, I want that. In fact, there's burning. God's mm. releasing burning on your hands. He's releasing even a burning on your heart. And I want to encourage you, I want to pray into that. What these revivalists, evangelists, miracle workers had of old, you have access to. And it was a hunger, and the hunger was specifically this. It's God, the Spirit who lives inside of me, I want Him to rest upon me. Mm. Holy Spirit, I know you live inside of me. You are the evidence I am born again. You are the evidence I am a son or daughter of God. But God, right now, and I want to encourage you to just cry out with me, yeah. God, we ask. We are hungry for that Holy Spirit who lives inside of us to rest upon us. God, here's our prayer. People don't really pray this way when we talk about the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Spirit. Lord, make my thoughts a suitable resting place for the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Make the words that come out of my mouth compatible with and comfortable with the Holy Spirit. In other words, is what I'm saying, uh, either from person to person, is what I'm saying behind closed doors, are the words coming out of my mouth, do they create a resting place for the Holy Spirit? Do, do the thoughts in my mind, do they create a resting place for the Holy Spirit? Are the places that I'm going, are the places that I'm going with my body, is the Holy Spirit comfortable with what I'm doing? What, what, are you talking about legalism? No, because legalism makes me more sin conscious. Legalism makes me extremely action conscious. In other words, am I sinning? We're, we're not living in this place of always wondering, am I sinning? Am I missing it? I'm living in this glorious place where I become aware of the Holy Spirit at a whole other level. Yeah. And I ask questions like this, Holy Spirit, is the conversation that I'm having right now, does that make you comfortable? Do you feel welcome there? Are the thoughts that I'm thinking about this person, Holy Spirit, do, are those thoughts, do they create a resting place for you in my mind? I, I, I believe, Pastor Allen, this is the next dimension that God is calling us into. doesn't mean you have to be perfect. I'm not. Praise God. Perfection is not what he's looking for, but he is looking for awareness. He is looking for a people who are like, who are, are we more aware of the Holy Spirit than what people say about us, what people think about us? Are we more aware of the Holy Spirit? And that's my prayer right now for those of you who are watching. Holy Spirit, the, you, I know you live inside of me, and I know I'm born again, but I ask you to rest upon me. I really think it's that simple. I ask you to rest upon me, and Lord, that I would host you well in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Something's happening right now to you. If you're praying that prayer, if you're praying that prayer, write something in the comments to let us know. Yes, I'm praying. I'm agreeing. And we're going to be standing in faith with you that what's in you is getting on you. Because mm. listen, what God does in you is greater than what happens to you. But he's about to do something so big in you, it's going to get on you and flow through you and get on your family, get on yep. your friends, get on your job. This is your moment. So let us know in the comments if you're praying that prayer with us right now. And in a moment, I want to talk about an illustration that you gave that really jumped off the page at me about hunger, about a child. You talked about a, a baby in church. But first, I want you to share this vision 
vision that you had of expository preaching yeah. and fire on the altar. Lay that out for us, because I think this is going to minister to a lot of people. And if you're hearing this right now, just keep praying in the spirit. Keep glorifying the Lord. He's, he's depositing something in you throughout this interview that will not be quenched. Share that vision with us. I had this vision of a church. It looked like a church that would be pastored by somebody like a John MacArthur or Alistair Begg. They are both more evangelical oriented pastors where the main focus and brunt of their ministry is teaching the word. And I saw a church like that where there was a pastor up there at the pulpit. He was preaching line by line, verse by verse. And it was a powerful, needed mm -hmm. Bible based message. And it was interesting because I then I in this vision I started to kind of pan around the church and I saw the people who were sitting in the in the church listening and taking notes, but then I looked down and right beneath where the lectern is where the pastor was preaching was the altar and it was absolute chaos there in the sense that people were being ministered to. I saw people who were shaking violently and trembling on the floor. I saw people who were like vomiting up because they were being delivered from demons. I saw people laughing in the spirit, people being filled with the spirit, people having hands laid on them for healing. It, it, it wasn't chaos in the sense that the leadership of that church had it out of control. In fact, I saw, I, I knew that there were prayer partners, there were commissioned leaders from that church who were taking each of these people into the different places of ministry that they needed to go. There are different encounters with God they needed to have. And it was interesting because I kind of panned to the altar. I saw this fire of God falling on all these different people uniquely. And then I looked back and as the Holy Spirit touched different people in the congregation, they would come forward as well and be completely overwhelmed by God while people continued to sit taking notes as the sermon kept getting preached. Mm. And I felt like one of the things that the Holy Spirit reminded me of is a statement he made to me many years ago. He said, Larry, in a church service, there are always going to be people who need the word and there's going to always be people who need the floor. Yeah. There's people who need what's wow. being taught in the sermon, but there must be a space. I'm not just talking about being laid out and slain in the Holy Spirit or soaking in the Spirit, although I saw both of that phenomena represented in this vision. I'm talking about people who need the floor, knees on the altar. They need to come forward to that place of encounter, which, by the way, it was Kim Owens in her book, Doorkeepers of Revival, who said, listen, in the 21st century church, one of the sad trades that we've seen is that we are trading the altar for more seats and bigger stages and sadly that's that has become quite true in many places we need to bring back the altar i'm not talking about necessarily a wooden bench i'm talking about a place in a church a place in a meeting it can be in a tent it can be in a field it can be in a beautiful building like i saw in this vision it is that place where people have space it is a place where people are given space to encounter God. And the reason I felt like the Lord said people need the floor is that place of surrender, that place of submission. I think one of the reasons people get slain in the Holy Spirit, fall down when they get prayed for, is not so much that they have this jarring, dynamic jolt of God. It's so that he can get them to the floor and he can actually do some business there, which he often does. You hear some of these testimonies about people who were on the floor and got healed, mm -hmm. got delivered. Holy Spirit spoke to them. Life change happened there. But I believe that's what's coming. I think it was Smith Wigglesworth who prophesied that the great, probably final, consummative move of God would be this move of word and spirit. And that is what I saw in the vision. The preacher kept preaching. He kept teaching. And we do need, I mean, we have a biblically illiterate generation yes. right now. We do need people who are willing to preach the full counsel of the word of God, line by line, precept by precept, which was happening in this vision, but then simultaneously creating space for people to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not one or the other. It's both and. Yeah, I think one of the rarest fivefold ministry gifts that we truly have is the office of the teacher, the master of the yeah. word who's anointed. But we need someone who is anointed with demonstration to teach with demonstration. And I think he's raising up people. People like that. And that vision that you had was so thrilling for me because mm. I see the urgent need for expository preaching. While at the same yeah. time, we need the floor and we need to give God permission 
who are who in the world are we anyway? But we need to give him permission to move in our services. And the illustration you gave about hunger really touched me. And I think this is important for a lot of pastors, ministers, people who help coordinate and run services and ministries. Tell me a little bit about what that means. That hunger means like a baby in a church service. Oh, the ba- the baby in the church service, in the sense, the baby crying out. Oh, yeah. goodness, I have yeah. to go back and remember, because I remember it was Tommy Tenney who cited That's that. That's right, yes. Yep, yep, from God Chasers. But it is one of those things where you've you've got a baby who's crying out, and they will keep crying out until they are satisfied. They are not going to back down. They are not going to relent. That cry is going to keep going until they are satisfied, until somebody meets that need. Hmm. And it was very interesting. I think it was, again, my friend Miriam Evans, she was talking about as a mom, you know, the I feel it now, you know the different cries of your child. Yes. Taking the illustration in a different way, because I remember it's been 11, 12 years since I had a little baby in my house. But I do remember that there were cries where it's like I didn't pay too much attention because I knew the cadence or the sound of that cry. And I know, OK, that's just a fussy cry or that's just I'm not getting my way cry. Mm-hmm. But there is a cry Miriam was talking about that gets a parent running. There is a cry that draws that parent. I mean, you could be upstairs as far away from that kid as possible, but that child cries out and it is that 911 desperation cry that attracts the parent. And I believe there is a sound to hunger. I believe God is not, he's not looking for a performance. He's not looking for us to whip it up, but he is looking for a cry. He is looking for us to cry out and say, God, I need you. I want you on your terms, Lord. I don't want to tell you how to move. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I am desperate. And it was in Psalm 84, I was preaching about this just recently, where it talks about the flesh, my heart and flesh, cry out for the living God. And the reality is this, when Mm. the living God is in our midst, which I pray that we would say, God, we want your spirit in our midst no matter what, because that's what it actually means to have the living God in your midst. It's welcoming the Holy Spirit on his terms, allowing him to do whatever he wants to do. I know I felt the same frustration you did, Pastor Allen, where we say, well, we let the Holy Spirit or we give him permission. I don't Mm -hmm. get that. I still don't get that, but I recognize that God is a collaborator. He looks Mm. to collaborate with his people, and he is sovereign to where he could and can break and do whatever he wants. But he is looking for a people who would say, God, we welcome you here on your terms to do whatever you want to. And I do believe that there is a cry that comes out because where we are right now in the 21st century, if we are not giving the living God, the Holy Spirit opportunity to move in our midst, even like we saw in that vision where we preach the word, we don't treat the word as secondary, but we also open up the altar for people to come forward and experience the power of God. If we do not give people that opportunity because we are afraid, we are ashamed, we're like, well, we don't like those Pentecostal manifestations, so we're not going to do that. If we don't give people the opportunity to encounter the living God, then I believe the cry of their heart and the cry of their flesh is going to look for a better offer. Please hear me. Please hear me. Mm. Because there is no better offer than God. We know that. There is no better offer than the Holy Spirit. But if we are not giving people as the church opportunity to encounter the real and living God, then the cry of the heart and the cry of the flesh is going to look for alternative outlets to be satisfied. And I can promise you this, the devil and the world are out there with plenty of counterfeits they are peddling to the degree that the church continues to lock and close the door to the move of the living God. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. And I pray that we are creating and giving God these atmospheres where he can meet with people and ultimately satisfy the cry of the heart, the cry of the flesh. 
If you're crying out for revival fire, if you're crying out for the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, and you recognize that all the dead churches around you, they may not be physically crying out, but within them, their souls, their hearts are crying out. This generation is crying out. This book is going to help you meet those needs and meet them where they are. You're going to discover what you're really crying out for, what it looks like, how to grab a hold of it. And I want every single person to get a copy of this book. In fact, Larry, we're going to hop over to the podcast. And I want to talk about unusual manifestations, because when we cry out for the Holy Spirit to come, we can't do that with preconceived uh, qualifications or notions of what we're going to allow him to do. We need to let him do whatever he's going to do. I want to talk to you about that, but I want to thank you so much publicly for writing this book, for making the effort, fighting what you had to fight to get this on paper, because I think this is going to be here for generations. Thank you. Well, I, I appreciate it. And wh one thing I will say is there's two things I'm hoping for that when somebody reads this. Number one, I believe you're going to be provoked unbearably. Mm -hmm. That is my heart. You are <laughs> provoked unbearably. Say, God, I don't want to just read about it. I want to experience this. And number two, here is this. The author of the book, I give you permission to put when you get to those places of unbearable provocation, when you get to those places where you're just hungry and thirsty for what this talks about, I want you to put the book down and cry out to God, because I believe everyone who cries out will be satisfied, will be touched by the Holy Spirit. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. That's Larry Sparks, ladies and gentlemen, the author of the brand new book, The Instant Classic, Pentecostal Fire. The link is in the description. Get a hold of it and of course go to EncounterToday.com for tons of resources to feed your faith and starve your doubts to death. We'll see you over on the podcast. God bless. God bless.